Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Yali 10 uh, Summit. Uh, my name is Monde Muyangwa, and I'm the director of the Africa program at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and I am delighted to be the moderator of this session. Uh, we are focusing on a very important issue for the continent today. This session is going to be looking at combating corruption in Africa with a specific focus on uh, the role of youth. It promises to be a very engaging session. So I am uh, glad that you are able to join us because we have an excellent panel of speakers that you will be hearing from uh, today. So we will look at the state of corruption on the continent, the measures and actions that are being taken to address corruption at both the citizen and the state levels. We will highlight some of the successes uh, talk about some of the challenges uh, related to anti-corruption efforts, and more importantly, we will offer some concrete uh, recommendations, or at least our speakers will offer some concrete recommendations on how we can move the anti-corruption fight forward, uh, particularly how we can engage uh, young people so that they can help lead uh, the fight against corruption in their communities and countries. So we've asked each of our four speakers today to offer some initial remarks of about six minutes. And after they've finished their remarks, I will moderate a question and answer session with all of you. I invite you to keep uh, sharing your comments, your questions in the session tab. And we will pass on some of your questions to the speakers when we get to the Q&A uh, portion of it. So let me very briefly uh, introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today will, will be Mr. Francis Ben Kaifala, who is the commissioner of the Anti-Corruption Commission of Sierra Leone. He is also president of the Network of Anti-Corruption Institutions in West Africa and an elected board member of the African Union Advisory Board on Corruption. Mr. Kaifala, over to you for your six minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and to be speaking to an audience. Um, I am Commissioner of the Anti-Corruption Commission of the Republic of Sierra Leone, as has been introduced. And in Sierra Leone, we have, we have built an anti-corruption effort on four pillars. The pillar of corruption prevention, corruption investigation, corruption prosecution, and public education. And as the Commission has the full spectrum of responsibility to do that, and as it stands, we've been doing this for 18 years, uh, for, 20, for 20 years now, because we, this all started in 2000 and 2001. The institution has been putting in a lot of efforts. Um, initially, before I came to the scene, several commissioners have come before me and have put in efforts to change the story of Sierra Leone, to change the trajectory of Sierra Leone, to launder the image of the country. When I came in back in 2018, we were performing very badly in global indexes and our position in, in terms of corruption control was very bad. But as it stands, we have put in full efforts on these pillars and uh, we have been able to transform the fight against corruption and uh, register several successes. Um, for example, in the indexes in 2018, in the MCC control of corruption, we were at 49%. Today, we are at 81%, which means we have jumped over 30% as an improvement. Also, Afrobarometer Corruption Perception Survey uh, in 2015, corruption prevalence was up to 70%. Now it has reduced to about 40%. And the same thing in terms of country rankings, we have continued to rise up. Um, in 2019 to 20, we were 12 places up in the country rankings in the fight against corruption. And that is because of our robust efforts we are putting in, in the fight against corruption when it comes to co enforcement. But most importantly, we have built a, fight, a strong anti-corruption fight that focuses on prevention, why setting examples in terms of corruption, prosecution, and of course, in terms of uh, um, investigation. But also because our country has a huge illiterate population, we have also built a powerful system of public engagement and public education to educate the public on the fight against corruption. And that is divided into four pillars. We have um, the public education department. We have the outreach department, which goes to the communities, the schools, and propagates the, 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 the message on corruption. 
but also we have the public relations department which really packages our information and send it down to the people. Uh, there are many challenges with our fight. It is not all rosy. We have challenges with human resources, personnel. We have challenges of, of, of resources, logistics, vehicles, money. Um, but uh, we are doing our best to be able to continue to produce the results the resource that we can in the fight against corruption, despite those challenges. And it's all shaping up very well because, like I said, there are improvements everywhere. Every survey shows that we are way better than what we were uh, three years ago, certainly better than where we were five, ten years ago. And it continues to improve as the years pass by. Um, we believe that um, a strong anti-corruption fight requires everybody on board. And that does not only in, uh, include us who fight. So we have a cluster approach to fighting corruption where we have the audit service involved, we have the financial intelligence unit involved, we have the police involved, and they all support us in our effort against corruption. We we'll also recruit the public to be with us as we do this. Most importantly, because myself, I just transitioned from being a young man to somebody to, to, to be <laughs> slightly, but we have used young people in this fight a lot because they identify with me, we believe that as a young person leading this fight, it is their fight, and I am one of them. We have been through a lot together. I was part of a lot of youth programs in recent times, and that has also helped by ensuring that young people engage with the fight against corruption. So that is the status of the fight against corruption in Sierra Leone, and where we are, um, we are still continuing to monitor the political will in the fight against corruption, but so far, so good. Uh, we have had a lot of support from the government. We've had a lot of support from partners in different institutions. And of course, we continue to, to, to enjoy a lot of public support for our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kaifala. So that was one uh, perspective in terms of uh, an anti-corruption um, commission at the national level. What I want to turn to now is our next speaker. Uh, Ms. Annie uh, Siniki, the acting team lead for Central, East, and Southern Africa at the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs in the U.S. Department of State, to talk a little bit about how the United States government is engaging in this one uh, dimension of anti-corruption uh, efforts um, with the African continent. So, Ms. Siniki, over to you. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to get to meet with all of you today to talk about corruption uh, in Africa and how important your and youth engagement is um, in tackling this issue. Uh, just a little context, um, in Africa and globally, uh, you know, corruption threatens security and stability of our partners. It hinders economic growth. Uh, it facilitates transnational criminal activity undermines respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, and it siphons away critical public and private resources um, that are needed to strengthen institutions. Um, while some countries like Sierra Leone are making great gains in combating corruption, um, overall Sub-Saharan Africa faces great challenges um, around corruption. Um, uh, per Transparency International's 2020 Corruption Perceptions Index, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is the lowest performing region in the world, which highlights really the urgent need for action and engagement. Um, also, COVID-19 really exposed gaps around corruption uh, in the healthcare system, uh, corruption risks uh, associated with public procurements, and the misappropriation of emergency funds. Um, bribery also continues to be a huge issue to access public services um, for everyone in their daily lives. Uh, so just, you know, they're, they're, the challenges are great. So um, some of what we do at INL in the department is we provide targeted foreign assistance to partners in Africa uh, to strengthen their capacity to investigate and prosecute corruption cases, to strengthen the rule of law, the justice sector and oversight institutions, uh, to promote public transparency and accountability and integrity. Um, we support building political will necessary to prevent and combat corruption and to reinforce the important role played by civil society, the media, and the business community to create- Excuse me, I, I can't hear the speaker. I don't know if he's speaking or not. I am. Sorry, we, we can hear you. We can hear you. Um, okay, sure. Um, okay. Uh, we provide assistance to multiple partners in Africa to support efforts to make long-lasting change. Uh, I mean, I say the person you invite to, to speak, uh, I, I cannot hear the person or... 
Sorry, Mr. Kondo, can you turn off the mic? Because we're actually in broadcast, somebody will help you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, sure. Please. Sure. Um, so just I know one partner we work with is the government of Kenya um, through a robust assistance program to support their anti-corruption efforts. We fund a resident legal advisor from the U.S. Department of Justice who's based in Nairobi, who provides assistance to prosecutors and training who are working on the most sensitive public corruption cases and also training to judges in corruption courts. Uh, we provide training to investigators at the Independent Police Oversight Authority to strengthen the government's ability to target public corruption and abuses among police. Uh, and we also in Kenya support the creation of a national whistleblower protection law, which is specifically intended uh, to reduce corruption in public procurement. Uh, while some of these programs focus on preventing and combating corruption directly, um, as you all know, corruption is often used to facilitate other crimes uh, or to secure impunity. Uh, so we also support programs that help officials and NGOs address corruption related to other crimes like wildlife trafficking, which foster instability and undermine economic development in African communities. Uh, we also manage um, authorities granted by Congress to deny entry to the United States um, uh, to corrupt current and former officials and their family members. Uh, we also support the Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program, Corruption Prong. Uh, further, we promote internationally recognized standards and commitments to prevent and combat corruption, uh, like legally binding treaties uh, such as the UN Convention Against Corruption. Um, almost all countries in Africa are party to that, the UNCAC. Um, and you can see how your country is doing on implementation. Uh, UNCAC has a re peer review mechanism where countries review each other's progress, um, and these reviews are publicly available online. Um, as, as you, uh, you know, have heard from me and you know, other speakers, these challenges are great. Uh, uh, and one challenge in anti-corruption reform efforts that we encounter is working with partners that have the political will and the space to actually create real change and reform, like to take rhetoric and turn it into concrete steps. Uh, it's very difficult. It needs both the political will and also an enabling environment, um, a push from the public. Just many pieces are needed. Um, so that's a big challenge. Uh, another challenge is that substantive reform takes time and commitment. Um, when you talk about shifting cultural and social norms from prevention to prosecution, the asset recovery process, these all just take yeah, consistent commitment and an understanding um, that the time is worth the outcomes to achieve real and lasting change. Uh, while these, you know, can feel corruption is a multifaceted issue, you know, it can be pervasive from your personal community, societal government level, it can feel overwhelming, but there are actions that we all can take to address this problem and youth have a really critical role to play in that. First, you are here at this panel and you're engaged, which is very important. So thank you for being here. Um, also, look at ways you can engage in your communities through civil society organizations, youth groups. You could join one, you could start one. Uh, Transparency International website has some great resources. They have a youth engagement uh, on anti-corruption toolkit. They list ways to get engaged, like asking officials for election pledges, um, committing to not paying bribes in day-to-day -day interactions, and using the arts as a way to raise public awareness. Um, so thank you for being engaged. Um, please stay engaged. Uh, thank you for including me in this conversation. Um, I look forward to our question and answer session um, with my colleagues on this panel. Um, and thank you all for working for change. Thank you, Ms. Saniki. So we've heard two perspectives, both from a governmental level. And I want to shift the discussion to hear from um, the private civil society uh, end of the anti-corruption fight. And it is now my pleasure really to introduce somebody that I have known years that I call one of Africa's anti-corruption warriors, uh, Mr. John Kitongo, who has been in this fight against corruption, working at the national, the regional, and the international level for over 23 years. He is currently the CEO of ANUCA, a non-governmental organization involved in issues of governance and uh, corruption. Uh, John, over to you. Thank you on mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And once again, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, be joining Yali, especially uh, this year. It's an auspicious year, 10th anniversary. Uh, and I'll get uh, straight into it because I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, in the Q&A. Um, a few years ago, I was asked to give advice to the government of South Sudan. 
uh, around uh, anti-corruption, uh, newly independent, lots of oil money, uh, and obviously difficulties around corruption, the capacity issues, but also a lot of theft that was taking place. And um, uh, I spent some time with some elders in the village, and uh, and I asked them, what is the word in, in your language uh, for corruption? Uh, and there was no word for corruption. And I went to another community and I asked, uh, you know, we talked about this, what is the word for corruption in, in, your, in your language, in the vernacular? And there was no word. However, there was a word for a thief and theft. And once uh, we discussed this issue, not as corruption, but as theft, um, all the people, all my interlocutors became very animated and went as far as to say, and the people of South Sudan love their cattle, they said, um, my wife, my daughter cannot be married by the, um, the son of cattle thieves. Um, there's a direct social sanction uh, across an entire community. And that, that got me thinking in this context um, after 23 years of watching us build institutions, uh, past legislations. One of the um, fascinating things that has happened, especially over the last um, t 10 to 15 years, has been just the, the growing sophistication of, anti of, of corruption networks and, uh, and the fact that uh, the sophistication of corruption that you see in Africa now mirrors that that you, you, you've seen in, in parts of Europe, Latin America, etc. And the networks that are involved in, uh, in, in the illicit uh, financial flows of corruption, of wildlife uh, trafficking, drug trafficking, terrorism finance, increasingly overlap, especially in the service sector, where the legal firms, banking, and, uh, and, and, and other, other service sector players. And it's led us to a conclusion with a bunch of group of colleagues that we've been thinking about this, especially over the last four or five years, that uh, we've almost reached the limit of technical fixes in terms of the fight against corruption. We've created institutions, um, we've passed legislations, uh, we have excellent legislations in many of our countries, uh, and uh, many of them uh, templates from, 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 from developed countries. Uh, we have anti-corruption agencies um, um, led by uh, people, my colleague Francis uh, in Sierra Leone, all doing great work. But we all acknowledge that the bluntest instrument available in the fight against corruption is prosecution. Uh, usually when you're prosecuting corruption, uh, those you're prosecuting have got more money than the lawyers that Francis has uh, in his office. So it's a slow and painful process. So how, how do you deal with it, especially in Africa, where in, in a country like Kenya, 75% of the population is under 35. They are youth. They are impatient. Um, they're, they're not going to wait 10 years for you to prosecute a large corruption case. And the, and the election cycle is every five years. So if there, there's that disruption every five years to, to anti-corruption efforts. And so how does one craft uh, an anti-corruption strategy that takes into account, number one, that the majority of our population is young, that we are fledgling democracies and Afrobarometer shows that we are committed to, to democracy, so that disruption will be there every five years. Uh, number three, that prosecution has proven to be very blunt. Uh, and so we, 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 it led us to some, uh, some interesting uh, conclusions, which I think are, are, are you know, academically sort of sound. Um, uh, I think you know in, in Washington, the Global Financial Integrity Organization, which is a very respected organization in terms of research uh, around issues of, of, of corruption. And uh, they would rank African countries according to their, you know, the, the level of sophistication of their institutional infrastructure and legal infrastructure to fight corruption. And what became curious was that some of the countries that were at the bottom of the Transparency International Corruption Index were at the top of, of, of this index of having good institutions and uh, good laws, Kenya being one of them, Uganda being another. And, uh, and we tried asking ourselves, you know, wh where's the dis disconnect there? And how come uh, in countries like Lesotho, smaller countries with not as developed institutions, not as developed uh, legislation, Botswana, uh, they are a lot more effective in the fight against corruption. And you dig below the surface and you realize that um, they, they build their anti-corruption um, strategies uh, 
on their local culture, uh, on, on traditions that already exist in those societies, uh, the nomenclature, the, word, you know, the, the way it is explained to ordinary citizens is in a manner that they understand because uh, Africans can be very aggressive against people who, who steal chickens. But uh, some, when you talk of billions of uh, dollars disappearing, that becomes quite uh, confusing. And, uh, and this is, you know, even the World Economic Forum in 2017 did, a, did a, an interesting study um, that for, forced us to ask ourselves some questions and, and, and I'll, uh, I'll close here uh, and you know, help, helped us to focus on the importance of social sanction, uh, even when you do have the institutions and the, and the legis legislation that, that uh, they looked at Italy. For 150 years, Italy has had the same legal and institutional infrastructure for fighting corruption, yet Northern Italy, is a lot less corrupt than southern Italy. So he said, what's, uh, what's, what's going on? And it all comes down to these cultural issues, some, which we sometimes in the anti-corruption corruption field don't take seriously enough. But the youth, especially through media and other cultural activities, are far, more, far better engaged and prepared to, in, to, to, to deal with uh, when, when, they, when they're when we're focusing in the fight against corruption. So it's to, it's to shift. We've spent a lot of money, a uh, lot of donor aid, building nice institutions uh, and passing great laws, but now it's to, it's to work on the imagination, the language that people use when they're dealing with corruption, to create that pol political will does, doesn't uh, happen. Um, it is manufactured, and it, it is especially manufactured by young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate uh, those words. And I'm sure we'll come up, we'll come back to some of the comments that you have made. Uh, let me see if we can get our final speaker on this panel online. Uh, he is Mr. Musa Kondo, who is a journalist and civil society activist with over 13 years experience in ver various community development activities, particularly in citizen engagement and participation programs for young people. Uh, he is the he is the founder of the weekly printed newspaper and, and Bama director for accountability uh, lab. So Mr. Kondo, are you able to join us? Yes, thanks so much. Fantastic, glad we could get you on. Your six minutes start now, my brother. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, sorry for the confusion last time. Uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, uh, it was great uh, hearing for uh, my previous uh, speaker. Uh, as uh, they say, we work a lot as an accountability lab to make uh, governance work for people. So through this, we have developed a lot of tools and programs uh, around combating corruption and also uh, good procedures and how to get people engaged and understand uh, how things function so they can be part of it. And also, uh, instead, I point fingers on uh, corrupt officials, but how to identify those who are doing uh, the great work in the system in group practices and uh, to share this experience so uh, so young generation or young people or uh, young uh, civil servant could take an example on them not just having uh, examples in the system where we have uh, uh, the corrupt officials uh, stealing money and uh, uh, share it around them uh, to get support from uh, from 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 people project names uh, uh, integrity icon uh, the first um, uh, things we do is to identify uh, young people all around the country so in Mali we have uh, 1200 volunteers from all around the country where we, we recruit and train them on how to uh, to be part of the process and the process uh, we send them in the field we deploy them to get nominations from uh, uh, citizens ordinary citizens whoever they are illiterate or illiterate, rich and poor, rural and uh, cities and uh, to people and explain them in your community if you can identify one or two civil servants who are serving you in your community and who you think they are doing great, they are doing uh, nice to people, whatever they have money or they don't have money, the, the, the very small service uh, they provide, so the quality of the service and all that. So as you know, Mali is uh, one of the the most corrupt countries in the in the continent. So um, as uh, um, uh, my colleague said, there is a lot of instrument 
to combat against corruption, but these instruments are not working uh, in, in the ground. So when we send people to the ground, so they identify people who are serving, and then we get nomination back from them online and also uh, on the ground. And then through different processes, we, we, um, we identify the top five uh, most honest civil servants in the country. So this creates a lot of communication, a lot of buzz on the internet, on social media, to see uh, or to tell people like we can, we have people uh, who are not known at all. They are not famous. They are not um, like very respected because they are doing the extraordinary work to make things happen uh, and not be in the corrupt system. Because the administration, when you are not part of the system, the system fights against you. Sometimes when you have a very honest civil servant in the in, in the service right now, uh, and if this person refuses to be uh, in a systematic corruption uh, system, the system fights this person. So, uh, with the identify honest civil servant, we put uh, we put a network of civil servants, so they know they are backed, um, supported, and also the network exists where they can meet each other to support each other when there is problem in inside the system. So through this, we organize what we call uh, public meetings to bring such kind of uh, uh, issues on the table uh, among the communities where we have uh, religious leaders, we have uh, uh, the uh, people in the, the community leaders, so they can all talk about how it is good to be honest in the system and how it's important to support the honest civil servants so they can provide uh, what we expect from them as a, as, as a citizens. As uh, you uh, you know, when we have uh, the national policies of development, and if these uh, policies are not implemented as they supposed to be, so we cannot get out anything from them in terms of justice, in terms of agriculture, in terms of uh, security, and we can see the consequences of what we're going through now. But by engaging young people in a, a lot of youth, so this helped us to build this network, a huge network. And now even someone meets a good practices in the system they pick up the phone and call us, say, uh, Accountability Lab, you should work with this person because they're doing incredible work uh, uh, in this administration. So we think a name and fame approach is uh, the, what we, we put in emphasize the name and shame in the process. So I will be, uh, I'm stopping here, so for this question to go deeper, uh, it be my pleasure. Thank you. So four really uh, fantastic presentations coming at the uh, corruption issue from a variety of angles, but all uh, reinforcing um, the points made and I think given us, giving us a much broader understanding of the issues at hand and at stake. I will now open it up to Q&A. I do have uh, a few of my questions myself, but I want to privilege uh, um, the young people, especially across the continent who are chiming in with questions. So one of the first questions that we got here uh, is, why is Africa regarded as a corrupt continent? And I think this really speaks to the issue. And my brother who sent in this question, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that why the way I'm reading this question, and I could be completely wrong, is really why is Africa the face of corruption for so many when we talk about corruption? If that's not a fair question, let's go back to the original question of why is Africa regarded as a corrupt question? And so, let, uh, sorry, a corrupt continent. Let me turn that off over first to John, and then I will uh, take a question, uh, I'll turn it over to Ben as well. So John, why don't you go first, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Ben. Um, well, um, especially, during the Cold War and into the early 1990s, some of the most colorful corrupt leaders, uh, you know, unfortunately, we produced them in Africa. Whether you think of uh, people like the em Emperor of Central African Republic, Jane Badel Bokasa, you think of uh, uh, Mobutu Seseko of Zaire. So these were larger than life colorful corrupt characters who who improve you know who further impoverished um their their, their countries and therefore made africa uh, stand out as being uh as as, as being uh, seen as very corrupt um 
and also in, uh, in in the indexes of Transparency International, for example, African countries were consistently in the bottom 25% was dominated by African countries. However, um, you know, questions are, have been raised, especially now with globalization, uh, you know, of this coloration between the countries which are at the bottom of the Human Development Index seem to be the same countries which are the, at the bottom of the Transparency International Corruption Index. And with globalization and the increasing sophistication, and I've seen a question here also asked about uh, state capture, um, the networks that are involved in corruption now are not only African. Uh, the, the young Africans that we are talking with and about here uh, educated, sophisticated people who are able to enter into complex financial transactions. And so uh, the, the corruption that you see in Africa, uh, I remember attending a conference in, in, uh, in 2016 in, in the UK where uh, President Buhari uh, replied to the British uh, uh, Prime Minister and said, yes, uh, we have a problem of corruption in Nigeria, um, but uh, uh, there is also a problem of corruption in the UK because a lot of the money ends up there. So this this corruption is is throughout the entire sort of bloodstream, financial bloodstream of the world. And sometimes we don't focus enough on some of these small little, very quiet offshore uh, tax havens where this money uh, ends up. I'd like to think that they are they are as corrupt as, uh, as as many countries in Africa, but they are much more shy about it. They don't uh, buy big shiny cars. They don't put themselves all over Twitter and and uh, and Facebook uh, with with their stolen wealth. They are much more discreet, and I think that that's the only difference. I would not say that um, it, there is that big a difference anymore. It's not like the, the way it was in the seventies and eighties. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Ben, do you have anything to add to that? You're muted. So I think that John has 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 addressed the the historical perspective around this. I will address the storytelling aspect of it. Yeah. It's um the way Africa is telling its own story, the way things are presented around Africa. I think that most of our storytelling is in the hands of other people. As that is the case, there are certain times, of course, we have a corruption problem. We all acknowledge it, but it's also true that it's everywhere. But the African one is the one that dominates the headlines, that is the one that is in colorful pictures, is the one that is presented irrespective of whatever good things are happening. So we are not much in control of our storytelling, and that is impacting also how we are presented to the world and how we are definitely perceived by the rest of the world, even among ourselves. Sure. So, I, look, I think what I'm hearing from you both is that uh, the face of corruption is global. It's not African. Uh, it's this transcends uh, continental, um, it transcends continents. And so I think that's a key point to be made. That doesn't mean that, you know, you we don't fight corruption on the African continent. I think it's placing it in its broader context understanding uh, the links uh, across continent and understanding the both the demand and the supply side of that, particularly as uh, it crosses uh, continents. So I think that's a powerful point to be made, but also how we tell the story. I am looking at the stats uh, Transparency International's um, index uh, for 2020, and we have five countries uh, that are in the top 50 in terms of doing really well on the anti-corruption uh, fight. Yet the countries that dominate and define Africa are those that fall in the bottom uh, side of the scale. So how do we acknowledge both the challenges, but also look at what's happening in these five countries, for instance, that are scoring so high on the uh, perce corruption perceptions index, take some of those lessons learned and see if we can amplify and uh, engage with them. So that's a powerful point. We have another question here, and this time I will turn to uh, Musa and to Annie to just kick things off. That uh, Kaku, I think this is somebody from West Africa, has a question about the differentiation between uh, petty corruption and grand corruption. And his point is that too often, you have anti-corruption mechanisms that tend to go after the petty corruption and not enough after the, the grand corruption. 
And I think that there are two layers to this question, really, that both of those things can embed uh, corruption in a society that makes it really, really difficult to untangle. Uh, but the, the core question of Kanku's question is, what mechanism, how can we do better with going after the grand uh, corruption? What mechanisms exist out there? And what are the successful prosecutions that we can talk about in terms of that grand uh, corruption uh, that we are aware of? So let me start with you, Musa, and then I'll come to Ani on that question. And uh, John and Ben, if you want to chime in, just let me know. Just raise your finger and I'll acknowledge you. So Musa, you first. OK, uh, thanks so much. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's very uh, crucial uh, to emphasize on uh, and not just instrument, but how to implement instrument. Because sometimes we've seen, when we talk about the grand corruption, we've seen it concerns people who are really in a high level and uh, consider it sometimes as untouchable in our systems. And uh, as uh, President Obama said a couple of times ago, uh, when we have uh, strong institutions, it could make laws and rules uh, equal to everyone, every, any kind of uh, citizen. So now we have uh, uh, what some of the best instrument in terms of uh, combating corruption in the continent. But when we take country levels, we will say individuals are stronger than uh, than systems, than institutions. So when it concerns, uh, it uh, it about uh, an individual who has been who is very powerful in the country, even is uh, uh, doing a lot of an open corruption where we we see and we acknowledge and. Uh, everything is in a place but how to get to the person and there is a, a very specific case happened here in mali where we have uh, uh, an institution named oclay office central uh, the lead control which is my illicit and this office uh, it, it said they cannot touch a minister for example a magistrate a, 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 a parliamentary so when you have a classified people you cannot touch uh, directly that means the mechanism put in place to get to these people really really strong so they feel comfortable in doing whatever they want to do in terms of corruption and know and um i mean aware the system cannot get to them so this is something and uh, one one of the, the most important thing we should emphasize if we want to go against uh, the grand corruption in our countries thank you annie you have anything to add to that um, sure. Yes, I very much concur. Um, and it made me think about an example um, from last year in the DRC um, with the change in administration there and the um, the incoming uh, President Shisha Kedi's anti-corruption reforms. They're standing up an anti-corruption agency. But then separately, um, last summer, um, one of his former aides, his former chief of staff, was found guilty of um, diverting, you know, $48 million um, in public funds and um, sentenced to, you know, 20 years in jail for corruption. So um, even sometimes kind of outside as this, you know, these other kind of anti-corruption mechanisms are being stood up, like the legal system there, you know, the prosecution um, move forward forward to, to get that done. So while I, I definitely kind of agree with what was being said, I do think that kind of having that, um, having that, uh, those efforts and that kind of focus can also still, you know, be complemented kind of by the systems uh, in, in which they are in. Um, and yeah, I'd be very glad to hear about what um, John and Ben think about this as well. Yeah, let me let me press on that a little bit because the questions are, are coming in on that very issue. And what I'm sensing is a very frustrated uh, African youth in terms of that cover, the difficulty of getting to uh, that big corruption that resides in, uh, you know, people who are politically connected, people who hold political power, and that that's really, really frustrating. It's easy uh, to go after the, you know, the people lower down the food chain, if you will, but the big money, the big resources, uh, appears to be in this uh, protected class, for lack of a better way of framing it. So they're, they're really pushing hard. Like, what can youth and others do to get at this big corruption that is so intricately tied in with um, political power holders uh, on, the, on the continent? I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I know, uh, John, that you've been working some of these issues. Uh, so let me start with you, so if you want to add anything to it. And then Ben, you can uh, roll in as well and uh, add your um, your points to it as well. So John. Yeah, 
Thank you. Yes, you know, one recognizes that um, there's only so much you can do um, to deal with corruption technically. Um, um, you know, using the institution, you, you, you know, you can pass the laws, you can have the institutions. Um, um, in in many countries, we even have asset and well, you know, asset and liability the, the declarations by public officials, etc. But still, one sees uh, um, high levels of, of of corruption, especially at the top. And one has to recognize at that moment, um, um, corruption ceases to be a technical issue. It is also now a political issue. Uh, it, it is now a political issue and has to be dealt with uh, politically and the kind of tools that are available, uh, especially to youth at, at that point, and again, I, I re-emphasize this, is, uh, are cultural tools uh, of social sanction. And, and I have seen a, a huge amount done, again, this is very from country to country, but I'm talking about, you know, in, in East Africa, uh, the role of, of, of media, of social media, uh, in in bringing social sanction to to bear against uh, political figures who have used their positions to repurpose in entire institutions. So what is corrupt is no longer corrupt because they've actually changed the laws uh, to, to to suit to suit themselves. The other thing is is timing is is when one uh, decides to to attack uh, 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 large scale corruption, and you know most of our countries across Africa are fledgling democracies and most Africans support uh, democracy. Um, the period in which you can get the most done in, in dealing with this high level corruption is in the 18 to 24 months immediately after a new administration comes to office. Uh, that's when the political will is at its strongest. And it's for, for, for young people, for civil society uh, to, to, to really prepare the, themselves to, to put as much pressure on the political actors uh, to, to take action during this phase because they've come into office promising all kinds of big things. We're going to fight corruption, we're promoting transparency and accountability, and to take advantage of, of those moments. But to recognize that after two years, they're now in the next election cycle and their attention moves um, elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ben, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, I think uh, John has said it well uh, in terms of the technical issue, but I will more come to the practical aspect of it. Uh, petty corruption is, is, is everywhere. It's seen every day. People interact with it every day. The evidence is usually not hidden. The evidence is usually there. Somebody does something because they are not sophisticated people. Sometimes they are not even hiding anything. So the moment an anti-graft institution goes in, the evidence will be lying there looking at you. But then grand corruption is more complex. It can be more littered. And as John said earlier, even when you go to court, those involved are powerful. Even in countries where you have the resources or you have the political will to go after them, they have lawyers who can challenge things forensically. So the approach is this. You have petty corruption, which the evidence is falling in your hands every day easy to prosecute you can see it everywhere even the people interact with it everywhere and they are writing and tweeting on social media around it but you have grand corruption which sometimes take longer to investigate and more complex to prosecute so that conundrum also faces institutions anti-graft institutions but it's easy for the public to think that oh they are taking two years to investigate this is grand corruption they really don't want to do anything about it but it's usually not also true and because grand corruption is not as prevalent as petty corruption, you don't see it every day. Uh, how many ministers are there in government? Let's say there are 20 of them. Okay. Most times when they say you have to prosecute grand corruption, they are looking at those at the top. But there are a few of them. And of course, among them, maybe one or two or three years may fall short in, in, in a period of time. But the public will think that an anti graph institution or an anti graph fighter does not want to do anything about it. So there's also that dynamics in terms of the complexity of dealing with the two spheres of corruption, the, the relationship with the evidence, how long it takes to investigate, and of course, uh, what you can do about it within a short period of time, which sometimes drives perception. But I agree, uh, generally in Africa, we have to do a lot more about gun corruption, and uh, there's more we can do if the political will is there and they are interested in pursuing it. All right, thank you very much. We have questions coming in, but let me end it uh, with youth. 
And um, this question has come in uh, various forms from a, a few of our participants. It's really about concretely uh, the, the, the role of youth, the role that youth uh, can play. Uh, one of the questions that we have here is, can corruption be fully uh, eradicated in Africa? And what is uh, the role of youth in the fight against corruption? Look, I understand the frustrations that youth are, are, are sharing uh, in the chat box. When you look at Transparency International's uh, report, this is also, I think, reflected in the Moore Ibrahim Index report. Um, you know, the, the 12 countries at the bottom of Transparency, in, we have 12 countries in Africa that are in the bottom 20 countries uh, as far as Transparency International's index is concerned. So that's a problem. And it's about how do we move uh, those, help to move those countries up uh, by improving the fight against uh, corruption. I think that's one dimension of it. But what I'm hearing from youth is this, and as uh, a mother myself, part of what I see here uh, in the frustration that I'm hearing is, you're seeing all of this corruption, grand or petty corruption, in whatever, however it manifests itself. What is actually happening here is that you have people who are stealing away resources from this current generation and from the next generation. Youth want to stop that. Those are national resources. Those are resources that belong to the people in their countries. So as youth, they are saying, we want to be at the forefront of that fight. Concretely from each of you in one minute, just one minute, actually make it 30 seconds because our session ends in uh, three minutes. So 30 seconds each, concretely, what can Africa's youth, what can YALI uh, members do to concretely fight corruption, whether it's in their communities, in their countries, or at the continental level? And I'm just going to take it the way, I, the, in the order in which we spoke. So Ben, you first. I think he dropped off. Let me go to you, John. Um, number one, um, can corruption be eradicated? There is corruption in every country in the world, period. Um, it's just more, in, you know, there's more in others than other places. Number two, what can youth do to start with? Number one, what you have is your voice. This, this anger that you, and, and, and frustration that you feel, please express it. And come together to express it, because you express it alone, you get in trouble sometimes. Come together to express it. That's a good start. It's a good release. Start there. Thank you. Annie? Thank you. I will concur on both points. Um, unfortunately, corruption is it's global. It's everywhere. Um, it's about working to try to, you know what I mean, make change where you can. Um, and as John said, use your voice, use collective power. Um, you know, um, you all are paying attention. You all uh, understand the issues that are facing your countries and how it um, as Monday said, is impacting uh, your generation, future generations, and taking these resources away. So stay engaged, um, and uh, yeah, please make your voices heard. Thank you. Musa, what you got? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, can you please just repeat the, the, uh, about, the question is about the youth uh, role in combating corruption, right? Yes, what can they do? Yeah, yeah, I think this is a really important question, uh, actually, because uh, for me, um, whatever instrument we have to combat corruption right now, I I'm sure it cannot change completely um, uh, the situation we have. So investing in the next generation by showing them the, the role models and saying things could really uh, function without corruption and without being the system is something really important. So we have a program. I think this is really helpful as uh, we emphasize on a civil servant training on how to be honest, how to be accountable, and also how to work with integrity. So uh, that's why we engage a lot of young people to say they can achieve whatever they want to achieve, be respected in the context, be understood, and also be engaged without being a systematic corruption in our in our in our countries in our administrations so uh, by responsibility by responsabilizing them would help them to understand like we have other things in the hand which is different of being the system 
because the case in Mali, as you say, in a transparency um, uh, list, what we see is uh, you are in the system, you, you are automatically part of something. It's kind of uh, elitist and also it's kind of a network where you do things together, where you still together, and where you protect each other in the same system. So when we, we, we show other examples to young people to say they can be whatever they want to be without being in this system is something important and they can handle in the, in the future. Fantastic. Uh, ben, what is your uh, word of advice in terms of concretely how can young African youth and YALI uh, in particular contribute uh, to this fight against corruption? You're muted. I think all young people should understand that everything being equal, if the continent is better, they will live longer to enjoy it. Everything being equal, because they are younger. Uh, so they have to make themselves into ambassadors of the fight against corruption. And they can set up movements. Youth represent dynamism. It represents uh, innovation. Uh, they are also very good with technology, so they can organize themselves to movements, community-based organizations, create blogs to promote anti-corruption. They can also start to expose instances of corruption taking place in their communities, offices, and generally in the countries. I think if young people understand that they should own the fight against corruption and really continue to support those who are fighting it, but they themselves getting involved by organizing when they see something, they say something, and I'm sure we can be able to create the continent that we all want. But let's not also forget that they have to be the example they preach. So you cannot be calling corruption, corruption everywhere, and you yourself as a young person, you are engaging into it. You have to live the example that you want others to be held to. That's fantastic. So I think some really uh, good practical uh, advice there. And I know our, our African youth are out there listening. Uh, actually, I was remiss. We actually have about five more minutes. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, just circle back to some of the really key points that I heard. And if any of you want to chime in and add uh, maybe a 30 second comment on it, uh, I would welcome you to do that. Just show me uh, a hand and I will acknowledge you. One of the first uh, issues that I heard in this session is the importance of how we frame corruption and anti-corruption uh, uh, strategies and, uh, and plans. That there is a disconnect that we sometimes lift lock, stock and barrel what is happening in other uh, countries in the West or elsewhere and try to place that in Africa and replicate it. I think the message that I got was the importance of domesticating those strategies and um, putting them in the correct cultural and local context that exists uh, within your individual communities and your individual countries if you want to see more success, that that is critically uh, important. So that was really, really important. And I think we need to, to remember that. And I think this is important for both the anti-corruption warriors on the ground, but also for those who in Africa who are in policy uh, decision making to understand that when they connect with the international community on this issue, that those points need to be made. Because sometimes those in the international community that are helping to fund this fight will not recognize it unless it looks like something they have seen before, right? So the importance of really putting this in its proper cultural context is key. A second point that I have heard is we need to look at our toolbox for fighting corruption. That corruption is dynamic. It morphs, it changes, and every time you think you have a toolbox that has uh, the things that you need in it to fight corruption, it has found another way of evading whatever you had in your toolbox. So remembering that that is uh, dynamic and ensuring that you're constantly keeping pace with those changes and reflecting on what's in your toolbox at both the government level, the civil society level, the media levels, to ensure that you can keep up uh, the fight and have the results that you're looking for. A third thing that I, I heard was really about 
the implementation. Africa has some of the strongest, strongest conventions against corruptions that have been uh, in place for, for, for years. The normative framework has been in place for years. But the issue is how do we implement? That's where the disconnect is, that implementation. And so as you fight against corruption, it's not about going back to reinvent the wheel. It's figuring out how you implement to get the results that you are looking for. I think that is really uh, an important point. So for me, that's a, a key part of it. A fourth thing that I had, I heard was about prevention. I think sometimes, you know, we wait, um, our frameworks, our strategies to tackling corruption after it has happened. What about investing on the front end so that you are working on that preventing, changing the culture uh, in the various uh, communities that you're in? There are places where this has become so embedded with everyday life. How do you begin to untangle that? How do you begin to work on um, the prevention side of things? How do you begin to set a different sort of uh, of culture in your community about how you perceive co corruption and how you fight against it. So that prevention side of it, what are the investments that need to be made uh, in that uh, area? A fifth thing that I heard had to do with rewarding and recognizing those who are fighting against corruption. It's always the people who are doing the bad stuff that make the news. But I really liked the, this, uh, this idea about rewarding, say, the most honest civil servant, amplifying those and what that means, whether it's at the community level. I know it happens, but I think we have uh, to do uh, even more uh, in that front. So I thought that was a really, really uh, important uh, issue. Another thing that I heard had to do with the strength in numbers. I heard from all of our speakers especially when it comes to the big corruption that can be frightening to, to, to handle. You know there are going to be implications. You know there are going to be consequences. You know you might end up in jail. How do we minimize some of those personal risks? You minimize those personal risks by building a campaign, by building networks that you fight that fight in numbers. You are likely to see more success uh, when you do that. Youth, we heard this morning and again in this uh, session, play an important role. They have to play an important role if we are going to succeed uh, on this fight. So own it. I heard that. Take it up. Protect your generation in terms of the vision that you have for the continent. Protect the next generation. We are all going to be grandpas here, maybe with the grandmamas, maybe with the exception of Ben. Uh, you know, the, the, the rest of maybe. us, this fight is now in your hands. You know, John has been in the trenches for 23 years. Musa has been fighting for 13 years. We want to pass that baton on to the next generation. You have this fight. It matters if you're going to realize the Africa that you want to see. It means resistance to some of the things that you see uh, some of the leaders trying to embed into our social fabrics in the various African countries. It means Africa belongs to you. Don't let anybody else define it for you. You define it, fight for your vision, that means if you're going to fight for that vision, it's stopping that outflow of resources that take away from development. It's taking the outflow of resources that steal educational opportunities for the young African child in the village, in the shanty compound across the continent. It's stopping those resources from flowing out that prevent uh, public service from working as effectively as it should in terms of responding to citizen needs. It's taking away, you know, those opportunities to that the opportunities where they're stealing monies that prevent Africa's voice and storytelling from being heard internationally in the way that it ought to be heard. 
So Africa is yours. Go fight this fight. And thank you so much to all of our four speakers today. Join me in thanking them for just absolutely wonderful presentations. And we'll see you at the next session. So thank you, John. Thank you, Musa. Thank you, Annie. And thank you, Ben. Fantastic session. And I thank you all. And thank you to all of you, the young people across the continent who have tuned in this afternoon. Bye-bye and see you at the next session. Bye-bye. All right, fantastic. I appreciate you all. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Hopefully, we'll see you at the next discussion. Let's keep this going. The fight is on. Thank yes. you all. Goodbye. All right, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.